shed his own blood for us, so that we might be partakers of an everlasting covenant and be one with him, yes, forever and ever. Amen. Who ever told you I was so weird so quick after that? <laughs> Did you ever have a date with Adam? <laughs> no, just an apple. Why didn't Noah go fishing? He only had two worms. <laughs> All right, last one. Where was Solomon's temple located? One side of his head, duh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, back to serious business. I want to talk about two things this morning that have been on my heart. I know Ron is my... My seed sower a lot of times, he talks a lot about the blood covenant. And I think in our Western world, we miss some of the significance and the power of the blood covenant that our God has made with us. And I want to talk about the blood covenant and circumcision and how those two are so foundational to our faith yes. in Jesus Christ and in our relationship with our God. So I want to spend some time this morning in Genesis chapter 15. I'm going to read verses 1 through 18. We're going to read it once, and then we'll go back verse by verse. Michael's pushing a lot of buttons back there. Are you ready to click some scriptures, honey? <laughs> After these things, and, and so just, just so Ab Abram has been called out. He went to a land that God will show him, packed all of his house, went out, already been through a war, and is still waiting. Okay, Lord, I'm going. Where are we going? What are we doing? You made me some promises. So far, <laughs> you just made me promises. And this is where kind of the rubber hits the road, and this is where things start. This is chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. I'm going to read that again. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Can there be a more powerful promise? And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house, no one, no, no, lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward the heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another, but the birds he divided not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them. And they shall afflict them four hundred years, and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. Thou shalt go to thy father in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, this is the second day. And it was dark. Behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. And the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river of Euphrates. 
So God starts by saying, fear not, Abram. I am your shield, and I am your exceeding great reward. I want all of us to just write that on our hearts, on our mirrors, on our walls. <laughs> Remember it. Carry it with us. Fear not. If God is our shield, that means he protects us, right? God addresses Abram's two greatest fears, the presence of evil and the absence of good. God promises to stand between Abram and all evil, all harm, and to be the source of every good thing in his life. That is a powerful promise. And how many of the scriptures expound, almost so many in the Bible, expound on that one single promise? I will be your shield and your exceeding great reward. Psalm 32, 7. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Psalm 121, 7 and 8. Thou shalt preserve thee from all evil. Thou shalt preserve my soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Yes. Psalm 138, 7. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thy hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. Isaiah 41, 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. 2 Timothy 4, 18. I could go on and on and on and on and on and on. 2 Timothy 4, 18. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work yes. and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. And to whom be glory forever and ever. 2 Thessalonians 3, chapter 3, verse 3. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. 2 Samuel 22, 3 through 4. The God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge. My Savior, thou savest me from violence. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. It is full. Our book of truth and life is full of his promises to be our shield and our exceeding great reward. What can we be afraid of? What can come against us? Jesus. God said, the land is not your reward. Your child is not your reward. All of the children that are going to follow your lineage, that is not your reward. I am your reward. I, the Lord God Almighty, am your reward. I am your portion. I am your promise to all generations. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always even unto the end of this world. Yes. To the end of all we see, God is with us. God is for us. And Abraham, he gets it. Verses 2 and 3. Abraham calls God a new name. He calls him the supreme God. The first time we see him use Adonai and Jehovah together. The supreme, all-powerful God. The self-existent one. The author of existence, the performer of promises, the manifester of himself to men, not creatures. God manifests himself to men and women. Yes. Abram is demonstrating that he, by calling him by these names, Abram is demonstrating that he understands God's complete authority and God's complete supremacy. Abram and God... But then Abram is also saying, God, you made me promises. 
right? He's reminding God, you said that you're going to give me this land. You said I'm going to have a child. You said you're going to give me the desires of my heart. And I want a son. I want an heir. And so God brings Abram out and he shows him the stars in the sky. We were those stars in the sky, church. We were those stars in the sky. We were the constellations that God said, look, Abram, you can't even count. When you get out of the city and you see the Milky Way, billions of stars, as far as the eye can see. Look up pictures on the internet. The Milky Way is glorious. And it is beautiful, and it is colorful, and it is full of vibrant stars. God said, you're going to have more sons than you know what to do with Abram, and you are going to be the father of them all. Because I have chosen you, and I am going to make a covenant with you. Yes. And Abram believed the Lord. And when he believed in his heart and acknowledged that God is the supreme God, he got accounted to him for righteousness. First, that tells us there was no righteousness in Abram. If his belief is the only thing that God counted as righteousness, that means there was no righteousness in him. So why do we look for righteousness in ourselves? We only look for God in our, in our hearts. Second, we watch God create a covenant and promise something new. Mercy. I'll be your shield. Shield from what? Shield from the, from the consequences of sin. From evil. Evil is the consequence of sin. Evil is the consequence of everything bad. And I will be your shield. I will give you mercy. And you will not have to pay the price. You will not have to deal with the evil. I will deal with the evil. And I'm going to give you a reward for something you didn't earn. That's grace, church. He gave him mercy and he gave him grace. A shield of mercy and a reward of grace. Grace is the bestowing of rewards you didn't earn. Receiving rewards you didn't earn. And we are literally watching the process of Abraham's faith. Abram, it's still Abram at this point. Abram's faith being born. We are getting an inside look into what is going on and the transaction between Abram and God. We're watching Abram go from wanting God's promises to believing and having faith in God's promises. <coughs> Abram left everything he knew to follow God into a land that I will show you. And so far there is no land that's his. So far there is no heir. So far God hasn't given Abram much of anything other than a promise. And his presence. Clearly Abram had expectations. But waiting in a state of suspense to see if God will do something, that is not faith. There is doubt in if God will. There's doubt left in that. Faith, after seeing the promise come to pass, is not faith either. That's sight. For the first time, we see Abram understand that God can, not if, God can, and God will. Yes. That's the difference. God will do what he has promised, even when he didn't see anything change in the natural world around him. And almost immediately, after his faith is counted as righteousness, he asks God, how will I know that you shall do this? You, you are going to do this. How do I know? What sign Will you give me that I will know that you shall do it? Wait, I thought Abram believed. It, God just counted his belief as righteousness. But Abram is asking for something he can hang on to when those doubts come back. He has acknowledged that God can, but now he wants assurance that God will do it. We are literally watching Abram go from waiting to see if God can do it, because he knows he can, to knowing God can do it. But will he do it for me? God can, but will he do it for me? How many Christians know God can, but still aren't sure if God will do it for me? That's the real question. He just needs one last reassurance from God to know that God is faithful and has already done it yes. for Abram. Yes. Did you catch that last part? Faith is not knowing God can, but knowing God already has done it 
for me. Yes. He already has done it for me. It is being fully convinced God has already done it so much so that it becomes our language, our confession, the words that flow from our heart, which is later on we see Abram's name change, right? So God decided to do something that he knew Abram would understand. He gave Abram commands to prepare the animals necessary to enter into a formal blood covenant regarding the land. Did God have to do this? Absolutely not. Did God do it anyway, knowing what it would cost him? Wow. Yes, he did. Yes. Because, see, in our Western world, we don't understand the significance, the power, the totality, the literally to the death oath that covenant represents. Yes. Each party agrees yes. when they enter into a blood covenant. Walking between the divided halves of those slain animals is each party's way of saying, may this be my end if I don't uphold my end of the covenant. May I die mm -hmm. and may my blood be shed yes. if I don't do my part yes. of what I'm promising. Covenant is a relationship. Yes. And you don't make a covenant, you cut a covenant. Yes, you, do. you cut it, there is always blood. You don't make it, you cut it. And it's a promise by each party with expected benefits. And it's permanent. Mm -hmm. It's for generations. It's for houses. It's for families that become joined mm -hmm. together forever. There are witnesses that attest to the, the covenant that's being made. We have a heavenly cloud of witnesses that attest to this day of the covenant that, that God made with Abram. There are signs of remembrance of the covenant. God told Noah, I'm going to put a rainbow in the sky as a sign of remembrance for the covenant I made with you. We take communion as a sign yes. of remembrance of the covenant that Jesus Christ made with us when he shed his blood in honor of the covenant that God made with Abraham yes. in the very beginning. Ooh. Signs of remembrance. So when we take that cup and we take that bread, oh, I'm getting goosebumps on my goosebumps. It is a sign of remembrance of the covenant that we are acknowledging and we are receiving the benefit of that Jesus Christ cut for us. That God himself cut for us. To break the covenant is death. And we know the death that God paid when he sent his son Jesus Christ. Yes. Not just a cut. Not just a drop of blood. But Jesus gave it all. He suffered immeasurably. Because the covenant demanded the price of sin be paid. And once you enter in covenant... Two become one. And the best example we have of that is marriage. God tells us that a woman shall leave her father's house and join her husband and become a member of her husband's house. And the two shall become one. What God has put together, no man can put asunder. Nothing can divide. When God puts two things together to become one, nothing can break them apart. Church, we are the bride. And God has made a covenant with us. And there is nothing that can happen in this world to break that covenant with us. He has joined names. He has given us his name. Our father has given us his name forever. And a father speaks for his whole house for all the generations to come. When a father cuts a covenant, that is forever. Do the sons earn the benefits of that covenant? Do the sons and daughters of the generations that come, do they do anything other than be born into that name, into that house? They get the benefits of their father's covenant forever and ever and ever. The children simply walk in the blessings of that covenant and the protection of that covenant and the, and the wealth of that covenant. We are in a unique covenant because we didn't enter into it with equal partners. Normally, covenants are cut between equal partners that both people can gain. What did God have to gain by entering a blood covenant with Abram? He wanted us. He wanted a relationship with us so much. It tore his heart up so much when he lost Adam and Eve that he said, I am willing to pay the price. Because I wanted a relationship, and I will pay the price to have that relationship with my creation, with my Adam and my Eve, and my Abram, and my Tammy, and, and my everybody. Everybody. 
I will pay the price because I love them so much. I am love. He entered into a covenant that he knew Abram had no way of keeping. He couldn't keep up his end of the bargain, and God knew, and he still entered into that covenant, and he walked through those slain pieces, knowing that it would cost him his son, ultimately yes. himself, yes. to pay the price for entering into that covenant, and he did it anyway. We know and understand that every single detail in the scripture has a purpose. Every single detail, every single word has a purpose, a sign, and a symbol has specific significance and significant meaning. Yes. So let's look at the elements that detail the blood covenant that God, in, God entered into with Abram. God's choice of animals. Why did he pick these animals? I don't, know all of, I don't know all of them. I'm just going to go over a couple. I don't know. I, they all mean something. Yes, they do. So let's pray to understand what they mean. Right? The turtle dove. I find it interesting. It means something that it was the mammals that were divided in half, but the birds were left whole. Right? The birds. The, bird, the turtle dove is a feminine symbol of fertility and a sign of the Holy Spirit. That is God's promise to bring forth the child from Sarah's womb. The child of promise by the power of the Holy Spirit. That is what allowed God to bring forth Jesus. By the power of the Holy Spirit in the womb of Mary. Mm -hmm. And it was what is that same quickening in Sarah's womb that brought life. And how many times did God bring a womb to life or a seed to life? The pigeon, also translated as eagles, as the e young of eagles or pigeons. Is that God's promise of renewed strength? We know what eagles signify. And a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat, both female, required sacrifices. Were these to strengthen his promise to the women that were going to bring forth the promises? It's the women that birthed the promises. He needed some female to birth those promises. Three years old. Why did they have to be three years old? Three is the divine number of perfection of maturity. Mm -hmm. Why the three-year-old ram? Wasn't it the ram that Abram found in the thicket when he went to sacrifice I I Isaac? Some say that the three-year-old three also represents the generations of Israel until, um, until they go into captivity, until the Israel is truly born. The gener three generations of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob and then the 12 tribes of Israel are born. Some say the three years represents the generations that will not have to bear slavery, and that the turtle dove and the pigeon represent the fourth generation and God's protection during their enslavement. Everything has a meaning. Yes, it does. The choice of animals. These were the clean animals that later became the animals used for sacrifice, for ritual sacrifice under the law. Signs of remembrance. Right? These were signs of remembrance. So every time there was an animal sacrifice, it was a sign of remembrance of this covenant. Even the birds of prey that Abram drove away have meaning and significance. The birds of prey are symbols of evil, symbolizing the efforts of Satan to thwart God's plans. They were coming to destroy the sacrifice. It took two days and two nights for this whole covenant to be wrought. Just like Jesus was in the, in, yes. in the grave two nights and rose on the third day. Yes. Preparing, dividing, and presenting the sacrifice. That was Abram's part, just like ours today. We prepare our hearts, and we present ourselves a living sacrifice. That's all that God asks, is we prepare and we present ourselves. And God, the smoking furnace and the burning lamp, walks and, and, and consumes the sacrifice. The smoking furnace God's promise that he will not be angry and pour out his wrath on us. The burning lamp, his promise to give us light, which is his word, to light the way before us. In the total darkness, it was completely dark, a horror dark. They described it as a horror, the darkness that descended. But God brought fire and light in the darkness. God was his own witness. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've been studying this as well. Smoking furnace, God is a consuming yes. fire. Yes. The burning lamp, yes. Jesus is yes. the light of the world. Yes. Jesus walked through that yes. covenant. Jesus 
was our substitute in that covenant. Yes. Yes. Oh. Yes. And it is the same today. Yes. We simply come. We prepare our hearts to receive him. And he does the rest. Yes. How easy has God made it for us? So we fast forward 50 years in an Ishmael. <laughs> and in Genesis chapter 17, Abram is 99 years old. And God visits him again. After an Ishmael, after Sarah and the whole debacle there. Uh, Genesis 17, verse 5. Genesis 17, 5. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee already. Genesis 17, 10 through 14. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you, a sign. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised. Anyone in your house needs to be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Uh, let's see, 14. And the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. So God takes his signs very seriously. These are signs of remembrance. And this was a physical symbol of the covenant between God and Abraham. And I know that we talk about Moses spent 40 years waiting for God. Abram, God walked between and made that covenant 50 years. Well, I don't, I'm not exactly sure, but it's probably around 50 years. He said Ishmael when he was 46, and now he's 99. Could have been even longer. But he believed, and God came back and said, because you have believed. I'm going to infuse my spirit into your name. The ha, the Abraham. God put himself in his name. And he said, every time you speak your name, who are you? I am the father of many nations. He gave him a testimony. Today in the new covenant, we have a spiritual circumcision of the heart that occurs. There's no more cutting that is ritualistic. No physical cutting. Because our, our covenant is not physical. Jesus paid the price of the physical covenant so we can have a spiritual covenant, a better covenant. And we have the circumcision of the heart that occurs. Uh, Romans 2, verses 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. There's something that happens on the inside in this new covenant. Romans 4, 11. And he re received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them to believe, though they, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So that's how they pass the righteousness. Abraham was, called, Abraham was called righteous, but he had to pass this righteousness through the act of circumcision. Jesus passes his righteousness through the act of circumcision in our hearts. Abraham had to do it physically, but Jesus did it spiritually. Galatians 2, verses 14 through 21. Uh, okay, so circumcision was a really big argument in the early church. Paul and Peter were not in sync. <laughs> and so because circumcision was such, that's how you accessed the blessings. That's how you represented the covenant. It, even though they weren't living under the law anymore, they had a hard time letting go of circumcision because they put all their faith in the circumcision. And God was teaching them, it's not the physical circumcision. It's the spiritual circumcision that matters. And Paul got it, but Peter was having a really hard time letting it go. So this is their discussion. But when I saw that they walked not upright according to the truth of the gospel, this is Paul talking about Peter, 
I said unto Peter before them all, I called Peter out for this in front of everybody, because we're going to have this out once and for all. If you, being a Jew, liveth, liveth after the manner of the Gentiles, if you're going to act like a Gentile and not as the Jews, not act like the Jews, why are you compelling the Gentiles to live like the Jews? If you don't want to live under the law, why are you putting them under the law? Because once you circumcise yourself and think that's your access to righteousness, you put yourself back under the law. It's not about us. It's not about you. It was about Abraham, and it was about God's promise to Abraham. That was the only way they had to access the promises. Jesus came and said, I am the new way. I am your promise. You access me by believing me and not hardening your heart. So why are Jews by nature? We are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. So anyway, they're arguing. And we'll go to Galatians 5, 1 through 6. Don't think you can earn it. That's what this whole thing means. Circumcision was their way of earning it. That was their Old Testament way of, of acknowledging and earning the righteousness. Because now I'm part of the, I'm part of the club. I'm in. I have the sign. I, 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 I wear the cross necklace. I'm a Christian. I have the bumper sticker. I have the t-shirt. I'm a Christian. That's what I do. No, it's how you treat people. It's how you love God. It's how you love people. Yes. That's what it is. It's not, I go to church every Sunday. It's not, I tithe. It's not this. It's how you love God, and it's how you love each other. Because if our hearts get hardened, we are no longer circumcised, and we put ourselves under the law. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage, the law. Jesus just set the church free from the heavy yoke of the law that no man was ever going to be able to fulfill. And they're already putting themselves and making a religion out of the grace of Jesus Christ. He set them free and they go about making a religion out of it. Jesus Christ broke the yoke of the law and we yes. have made a yes. religion out of it. Yes. We created the law light. We created religion light. There is no room for the law in grace. There is no room for rules and regulation as great. There is no room for any of that in the New Testament, in the New Covenant. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye being circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. If you are circumcised and you think you have access to righteousness, what do you need Jesus for? Exactly. What do we need church for? Why are we here? What do we need it for? We got it all figured out. We're circumcised. We're good. We don't need anything else. We're good. I have it figured out. I have it done. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. You cannot mix the old covenant and the new covenant. It breaks the wineskin. You cannot have a little bit of the law and a little bit of grace, and call it something different. It's all or nothing. Our God is all or nothing. You were circumcised or you were not. You follow his new commandments or you don't. Okay, get myself all worked up. <laughs> Circumcision of the heart is not just New Testament. This is not a new concept. God was trying to teach them not to harden their hearts. He's like, look, you're doing this outwardly, but I want you to understand this is a matter of the heart. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. To love God is to live. Yes. I don't know how to live without loving God. He yes. is our source. Yes. He is our shield and our exceeding yes. great reward. In Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 through 16. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. Behold, the heaven and the heaven of the heavens is the Lord thy God, and the earth also, with all that therein is, everything is God's. Only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them above you 
even you above all people, as it is this day. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. Stop being such a hard man. The circumcision of the heart is all about love. Pure love. God love. When we have been circumcised in the heart, we are able to follow. I should say only when we have been circumcised in the heart, we are able to follow the two commandments that Jesus gave us in the new covenant. Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is just like it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang everything. Love God and love your neighbor. We've had this discussion before, but who's your neighbor? Are they a human? Then they're your neighbor. If our hearts are hardened, if we are not able to love God, if we are not able to love our neighbor, then we are not living in the fullness of the new covenant, and we have hardened our hearts and cut ourselves off. And um, I want to read... Deuteronomy 29, verses 9 through 15. We cut ourselves off from the promises, from the blessing. Deuteronomy 29, 9 through 15. Keep therefore the words of this covenant, and do them, that ye may prosper in all that ye do. Ye stand this day, all of you, before the Lord your God, your captains of your tribes, before your elders and your officers, with all the men of Israel. All the witnesses, your little ones, your wives, and the stranger that's in this camp, from the hewer of thy wood and to the drawer of thy water, that thou shouldest enter into covenant with the Lord thy God, and into his oath, which the Lord thy God maketh with thee this day. He is making this oath, a new covenant, well, same covenant, but Old Testament covenant, that he may establish thee today for a people unto himself, and that he may be unto thee a God. As he hath said unto thee, and as he hath sworn unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, neither, will, neither with you only do I make this covenant and this oath, but with him that standeth here with us this day before the Lord our God, and also with him that is not here with us this day. This promise, this covenant, this is the continuation of the promise and the covenant with Abraham. They had witnesses. They had the signs. There's a new covenant. And in Deuteronomy chapter 30, they tell us specifically the blessings that come with fulfilling and following the laws of this covenant. And it shall come to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations, whether the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, Thou and thy children, with, with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all nations, whether the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. If any of thine be driven out into the outermost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possess, and thou shalt possess it. And he will do good, he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. And, and the Lord thy God will circumcise thy heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. And the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies and all them that hate thee, which persecuteth thee. And thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments which I command thee this day. And the Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every work of thine hand, and the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy land for good. The Lord will again rejoice over thee for good, as he rejoiceth over thy fathers. And if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in this book of the law, if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul. And in verses 11 through 16. 
For this commandment which I command thee this say, it is not hidden from thee, neither it is far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up to heaven for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who will go over the sea and bring it, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is nigh unto thee, unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. We don't have excuses. You can't say, oh, who's going to go to heaven and bring it? Who's going to go across the sea? It is in us. We know the word of God. We feel the love of God in us. See, I have set before thee this day life and good, death and evil. He drew a line. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land, for that thou goest to possess it. Yes. Um, Hebrews 8, verses 5 through 8. The old covenant wasn't perfect. So that's why we needed the new covenant. Because it is perfect. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern shown to thee in the mount. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And Hebrews 8, 13. And in that he saith, A new covenant he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxed old is ready to vanish away. The covenant was established for our Heavenly Father. And there's... the. So, the new covenant is very simple. We love the Lord. We love our neighbor. We love. We are to become love. When we withhold love, we withhold God's grace and provision and shield and reward. God has given us grace. He's freely given it to us. Who are we to decide who deserves God? Because if we were to decide who deserves it, the answer would be no one. Not one of us. So do we need to know everybody's business? Do we need to be concerned with everybody's business? Or do we just help to restore them to yes. the faith? Do we help to encourage them to taste and see that God is good? Yes. Do we need to reach out and tell that one person that needs to hear it before they make a choice that has eternal consequences? God loves you. God died for you. The one sheep. He will go for the one out of the 99. Luckily for us, the new covenant is not reliant upon us performing it. We understand that once the blood of Jesus purchased the new covenant, there is nothing left but love. Pure love. That, my friends, is the grace of God freely given for all who believe. And I want to end today with this last scripture, Romans 8, 38 through 39. God wants us to understand the depth, the height, yeah. the breadth, yes. the totality, mm -hmm. the immenseness, yes. the eternity of his love and his promises to us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yes. The message says, this, none of this phases us because Jesus loves us. I am absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our master, has embraced us. The Passion Translation. 
So now I live with the confidence that there is nothing in the universe with the power to separate us from God's love. I am convinced that his love will triumph over death, over life's troubles, over fallen angels and dark rulers in the heavens. There is nothing in our present or future circumstances that can weaken his love. There is no power above us or beneath us, no power that could ever be found in the universe that can distance us from God's passionate love, which is lavished upon us all through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Anointed One. I read a book a long time ago that says one drop of the blood of Jesus is more powerful than all of the sin, oh, yes. all of the evil. Yes. One drop of the blood of Jesus. And he gave it all when he cut that covenant with us. Yes, yes. He cut it perfectly so that we might be able to love him and to love one another. And he has promised in return, I will be your shield and your exceeding great reward. Yes. So go in Jesus' name. Yes. 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 Yes.